most their fossil remains in Java. But this nearly human species was very different from Dubois' idea of an upright walking ape man. In his mind, he'd found the perfect mix of ape and human characteristics for a missing link. Where's my subiki? All he had to do was convince the rest of the world. Like a big snark, sir. And it wasn't going to be easy. I think he must have thought that the world was ready for this, and when he announced it, uh, the world of science would be at his feet for making this great discovery uh, that the world had been waiting for. And of course it didn't work out like that, because when Dubois actually tried to publish the material and showed people the material, their view was that it was too ape-like to be a missing link. Dubois was convinced to the end that his fossils represented a missing link. But the scientific world did not agree and rejected his claim. Because he never attended his own dig, he couldn't even prove his pieces belonged to the same creature. The verdict of most experts was that the leg was human, but the skull looked like an unknown species of ape. He leaves the Dutch East Indies, he goes back home, and no one's paying any attention to his work. No one's paying attention to his fossils. And it must have just broken his heart. He ended up basically assembling his fossils and said, right, if you're not going to pay any attention to me, you're not going to get access to my material. Must have been one of the greatest sulks in scientific history. If you don't believe me, you can't look at my stuff. The scientific world ultimately recognized the true value of Dubois' discovery, but not for several decades. In the meantime, the search for the missing link continued. And at the start of the 20th century, the focus turned from Asia back to Europe, because in Britain, a discovery was made that amazed the world and created one of the biggest scandals in scientific history. Arthur, look, look, teeth. What? Suddenly, what teeth? a new contender that fitted the idea of a missing link perfectly. In fact, it was almost too perfect. Well, Dr. Watson, what do you think? But then, forgeries often are. In December of 1912, in London, a new fossil contender for the title of Missing Link was about to be unveiled at the very centre of the scientific establishment. This time, the experts were ready to be convinced, because this was the perfect ape-man. And it was British. There was this tremendous uh, rivalry between Britain and Germany building up to the First World War both nationalistic, artistic, and, and certainly scientific. And the fact that Britain had nothing to match the Neanderthal find, I think, was a factor in the success that Piltdown had. Once it was delivered, here was evidence that we could match anything the Germans had. There was a sense of expectation among the eminent guests of the Royal Geographical Society, and Charles Dawson was about to become the most celebrated fossil finder in the British Empire. Gentlemen, may I introduce you to Piltdown Man. The reconstructed skull showed the exact combination of features everyone had expected to find in the missing link. What they felt at that time that the essence of humanity, the essence of being human was the large brain size. And their concept of the missing link was a large brain uh, mixed up with some eight black characteristics. And this is, of course, what Piltdown Man was. So, is Piltdown Man just another early man? On the lines of Neanderthal? I think not. 
Why? The jaw. What Piltdown delivered was what many British experts were hoping for. Something that seemed to have a large brain in a modern shaped brain case, although rather thick and primitive. And in the jawbone, we have evidence of a much more ape like jaw and teeth. And this weird combination was what actually some British experts had predicted that the brain had grown large early on in human evolution, but the teeth and jaws lagged behind. And Piltdown seemed to show that, and what was more, it was British. Three years earlier, the first piece of Piltdown Man had emerged seemingly by chance. Workmen digging a road had found what they thought was a coconut and casually smashed it. It was Piltdown Man's skull. Charles Dawson was an amateur fossil hunter with a burning ambition to find something truly earth-shattering. He'd walked past this site regularly in the hope day, that man. something significant might emerge. How do you think today? His perseverance was finally well, rewarded. We've got this. When he examined the first piece, he instantly recognized it as a skull fragment. Where's the rest of it? And there could be more. Be in there somewhere. Do you think you could find it for me? I can try. Agreed? Quite so, yes. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Good. Good. Dawson knew he was onto something at last. But to get maximum exposure for his find, he knew he'd need to involve an expert. A year later, he'd persuaded Sir Arthur Smith Woodward of the British Museum to join in the search for more evidence. The skull fragments looked vaguely human, but they hoped to find evidence that its owner could be older and more primitive. Evidence of something more ape-like. And in a surprisingly short time, they'd found it. This is definitely not a stone. Arthur, look, look, teeth. What? We've got teeth. It's me. It's the, the evidence thing. seemed conclusive. And with Smith Woodward's support, Dawson felt able to make his boldest claim. It is my conjecture that what I have termed the Anthropus Dawsoni, Dawson's Dawn Man, is nothing less than the missing link we have searched for so long. Thank you. For the British scientific establishment, here at last was what they'd long wished for, the perfect missing link, a big-brained British ape man. The fossils are perfect for a missing link. Some of it seems to be human, some of it seems to be ape. It just fits perfectly right in between. In your search for an ancestor, that's what you want. You know, it was almost too good to be true, but because everyone was, ex was looking for something, because everyone wanted to find that first Britain, nobody dug deeper. Gentlemen, please, gather round. It seemed the missing link had been found. Yet while Dawson savoured his moment of glory, his audience was unaware they'd all been taken in by the greatest hoax in scientific history. And it would take decades for the truth to be revealed. While the experts in England contented themselves with fakes, real scientific treasure waited to be discovered. But it was in a part of the world that no one at this time even cared to look, Southern Africa. Charles Darwin believed Africa might be the cradle of humanity because it was the home of the great apes. If our closest ape relatives were still there, then the ancestral link between us might lie there too. If so, evidence was bound to turn up sooner or later. It just needed someone to recognize it when it did. Thirty-one-year-old Australian doctor Raymond Dart had recently arrived in South Africa to begin his teaching career. 
Soon after, his friend was getting married, and Dart was the best man. Keep still. He and wife Dora had half an hour to finish getting ready. Now wait there, I'll have to put it back on. But Dart's mind was elsewhere. He'd been collecting fossils for the last few months, sent to him by students and colleagues. A week ago, he'd got news of a spectacular fossil found in a nearby lime quarry, and it had just arrived by train. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, just leave it inside the door there. Thanks. Dart's wedding duties were just minutes away, but he couldn't wait. The promise of a spectacular find was too much to ignore. I'll be one moment. I'll be quick. I just want to make sure it is what I think it is. You can't go burrowing in boxes of rubble now, Raymond. You really, really can't. I won't take long. Raymond, please just leave them alone until tomorrow. Be quick. The first thing he saw was material he'd seen a dozen times before. But then, something he could never have dreamed of. A brain. To be precise, the space once occupied by a brain, now filled with fossilized sand. I knew at a glance that what lay in my hands was no ordinary ape brain. Here was the replica of a brain three times the size of any baboon and considerably bigger than an adult chimpanzee. Yet it was not big enough for a primitive man. But whose brain was it? Dart looked to see if there was more of the same creature. He found a piece of rock with the outline of an upper jaw. Behind it, a hollow space. When he matched the brain to the hollow, it was a perfect fit. He realized he had both the brain and skull of an unknown ape man, but the face was buried in solid rock. Christo is here. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Please, this is getting silly. Powerless to reveal its identity immediately, but Dart knew just a few inches of rock separated him from a momentous revelation. Raymond Dart had been sent the head of a fossilized ape man, which he hoped might be the missing link but it was buried in a lump of solid rock. It took him seven weeks of painstaking work to reveal its identity. It was the first human ancestor found in Africa and the earliest ancestor yet discovered. The moment of truth came on Christmas Eve, 1924. What emerged first were its teeth, small and fine like the teeth of a child. But then the outlines of its skull, more ape-like than human. When it was finally revealed, Dart realized he'd uncovered something extraordinary. A combination of human and ape features that had never been seen before in the face of a child. <laughs> 